Please join me in a salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening and welcome to the Selectmen's Meeting of May 16th, 2017. We only have one thing on the agenda tonight, and that is a presentation from the New Hampshire Municipal Association, Attorney Stephen Buckley. Uh, we'll be giving that presentation. What we're going to do is he's going to give his presentation, and in a minute, uh, Mark Gerald will introduce Attorney Buckley. He's going to give his presentation. During the presentation, if somebody has general questions that they would like to ask, you'll be able to do that if they're a general question. At the end of his presentation, we're going to adjourn into a non-meeting with legal counsel, and that will be for anybody who is an elected official or an appointed official can stay for that. And that you can get into more specific questions, and Attorney Buckley will tell us about that. So, Mark, why don't you introduce him? Sure. Uh, we're fortunate today to have with us Attorney Stephen Buckley, who is the uh, Legal Services Counsel at the Municipal Association, of which we're a member. Uh, one of the benefits of association membership is this um, gratis uh, presentation. And Steve, is, I think this is the third consecutive year you've been here That's to speak. Uh, this year, unlike some past years, we've broadened the audience. And so uh, elected and appointed officials from uh, many boards and commissions are here tonight. Uh, Steve has been a member of the New Hampshire Bar Association since 1984 and has then since then was uh, in private practice for 30 years, in which case approximately 60% of his private practice was in municipal law. Uh, he's a graduate of San Diego State University and then attended uh, and got his law degree from the what is now the University of New Hampshire Law School. Uh, he has sat on uh, the planning board in Bow for 12 years and has served since 1991. 88. 1988. 1988 on the Central New Hampshire Regional Planning Commission. And uh, he joined the New Hampshire Municipal Association in May of 1984. Uh, there are two items that may be of assistance uh, to you. And uh, for any of those of you who have not signed in yet, uh, as officials, if you could do so, there's a sign-in sheet there, uh, which we'll share with the Municipal Association. And there are a number of handouts, but two of which would be important. One handout is of the slides that Attorney Buckley is going to be using, and the other at the very end of the table is a selected portion of the Right to Know Law sections in RSA 91A, which is our focus this evening. So with that, uh, thank you, Steve, and it's all yours. Thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you to the Select Board for inviting me here tonight. And also want to thank the uh, Town of Hampton for being a member of the New Hampshire Municipal Association that allows us to provide these programs, to provide these trainings to local elected officials. Um, I want to just go over the materials that you may have picked up. But just as Mark has said, we've provided you a handout, which is the slides. So there's three slides per page, so you can take notes. Um, one other thing that I will go over in great detail, so I want to make sure everyone has a copy. It's the uh, non-public session minute document. It actually is a checklist that you should go through if you're in a non-public session. And it's a one-stop checklist for compliance with the right to know law when you're using a non-public session. Um, I mentioned the workshops that the New Hampshire Municipal Association provides. Every year we put on local officials workshop, new local officials. It's a free all-day program designed to train new elected and appointed officials on how to be an effective local official, knowledge about their particular boards and commissions, right to know law, many other things. Uh, we have two more such workshops, which all of you here in the room could attend. There is one scheduled for Stratum on May 23rd. So it's free. Well, yes, it's free because you're members. Uh, but you get breakfast and lunch, and it's an excellent program, and it goes from 9 to 4. Uh, if you can't make the uh, local official workshop in Stratum, we have another one scheduled for Saturday, June 3rd, at our offices in Concord. So recommend that to you if you want to learn more about the overall business of being a local elected and appointed official. Um, 
We also, uh, in addition to this kind of program that we do on the Right to Know Law, we have uh, stepped up our activity in trying to train local officials on the Right to Know Law. We have written a brand new book called A Guide to Local Government, the New Hampshire's Right to Know Law. Along with that book, we're rolling out workshops. And now that work, that new publication and the workshops, the first workshop will be on Thursday, June 8th. And there's a flyer on that, so if you wanted to attend, you would become a particularly expert and knowledgeable person about the Right to Know Law. And finally, um, if not enough, um, I, my favorite uh, synopsis of how to be an effective member of a local or appoint an uh, official in a local board or body um, is penned by a gentleman named Fred Riggins. Uh, we've excerpted uh, his, what we call Riggins rules. He was a member of the City of Phoenix Planning Commission for many years, and he penned this set of rules which are a really excellent guide how to be a really effective local official, whether you're a board member or a chair of a board. So I recommend this uh, as a good reading to understand how better to be a, a, a local official in your community. So uh, this program is designed to give you just about two hours of the right to know law, plus um, a section that we will discuss about conflicts of interest and incompatibility. So it's basically the right to know law. It's broken into two parts, public meetings, which includes non-public sessions, and governmental records. And at the end of the section on governmental records, we also talk about the remedies that are available under the right to know law and retention of public records. Uh, and again, as I said, we'll also conclude with a, sm a short a smattering of introduction to the ideas of conflicts of interest and incompatibility. So, when we talk about the right to know law, uh, we also uh, talk about, and I have to be concerned with, the New Hampshire Constitution. The New Hampshire Constitution is the source of the right to know law. Part 1, Article 8 of the Constitution, our New Hampshire Constitution has a specific mandate and creates a specific right of the citizens to make sure their government should op be open and accountable. And from that constitutional provision, we got our right to know law in 1967. Now, in the 1960s, it was common for our local government, including the federal government, to be adopting open government sunshine laws. And it was at that time, during that era, that our right to know law came into existence, RSA 91-A. So that law is in furtherance of this constitutional right that under Part 1, Article 8, government should be open and accountable to the people. Because that is true, um, we as lawyers know that when you have a constitutionally based right, judges are particularly attuned to ensure that that right is given the, the most possible enforcement and the words are given great weight. Um, and so as we say often in the law, uh, when a government is compelled by a constitutional duty, government is going to be require, required to turn square corners. No cutting corners with the right to know law. So it's that, that's an important thing to keep in mind. So whenever there's a violation of the right to know law, uh, the, the, not only do the courts pay very careful attention, but the, the, the law is construed in the light most favorable to openness in government. There is one provision of the right to know law that I always like to bring to people's attention, and this is found in 91A2, uh, Roman 2. And it's a small sentence that's inserted, but you could miss it because the right to know law contains a lot of language that you have to spend a little time teasing out the important uh, sentences and paragraphs. This one in particular is important because it says, if a town or city has local rules of procedure, that require broader public access to public records or um, ability to participate in public government, those uh, uh, local rules of procedure will govern. So for instance, um, you may not know this, but under the right to know law, there's nothing in the right to know that it says when a public body is going to have a meeting that you have to post an agenda. In fact, what the right to know law says is you have to give notice of the date, time, and place of your meeting. But the statute does not say you have to list the agenda of the items you're going to address. Uh, now, I'm talking about 
the right to know law, which is the minimum compliance for a public body to meet and comply with the right to know law. There are many other statutes, such as planning board statutes, ZBA statutes, that require specific notice of actions a public body is going to take. I'm talking about the minimum. So there is no requirement that you have an agenda. But if your local rules of procedure say, for instance, and it's very common, select board might have a local rule of procedure describing how the select board runs its job or does its job, that, that rule of procedure might say the select board will post an agenda 24 hours before the meeting and it will list the items that will be addressed. If you have such a rule of procedure, that becomes, in effect, your local right to know law. So I point this out not to say you should be not having an agenda or not doing things that allow people to have greater access to government, but to understand if you have them in your rules of procedure, they become part of, in effect, what's called your local right to know law. So public meetings break down to three fundamental requirements. If you're going to have a public meeting, you have to have A, public notice, B, you have to let the public attend, and C, you have to have minutes. Those are the three essential requirements of what a public meeting is all about. And it obviously alerts to the public that a meeting is going to take place. It makes clear that the public can attend, and there are other attributes of the ability to attend a public meeting, including, and we'll get to this later on, any member of the public can record what's going on at a public meeting. They can record it by videotape, by audio tape, any manner they wish to. And then the public body has to produce minutes within five business days of completing their public meeting. Those are the essential characteristics of public meeting requirements. And it's important to always keep those in mind when you come to the point of having a public meeting. So that begs the question, what's a public meeting? And it comes down to a couple of simple statements in RSA 91-A. And number one, um, any time a quorum of a public body meets. So what does a quorum mean? Well, the statute is very clear about that. A quorum is always a majority of a public body. And by the way, the statute also makes clear you could not define your quorum as being an amount greater than a majority. So, for instance, let's assume for a moment the select board of five said that in order for the select board to conduct business, the select board had to have four members present. That's your local rule of procedure. However, the right to know law would supersede that and say, three members is sufficient to create a quorum for compliance with the right to know law. If you have three members present, you have the beginning, the essential elements of what could be a public meeting. So a quorum of a public body, that's the starting point. But then the next thing has to be true. The members of that quorum of that public body have to be convening so they can contemporaneously communicate. So typically, that's very easy to understand. If you're all in the same room and you can speak to each other, you're convening, you're in one place, and you can con con contemporaneously communicate. But it also uh, attaches to issues such as, well, what if uh, uh, three members of a select board of five are communicating by text message with each other or through a chat room or by email? Those could be forms of convenings which could then trigger the obligation to comply with the right to know law. And, of course, you can't comply with the right to know law if you're communicating by text or by email, because the public can't attend and observe your communication. So it's a quorum, which is always a majority, convening, and then the third thing, which is the definition of a right to know law, you're convening to act on matters over which that public body has supervision, control, jurisdiction, or advisory power. So once you have a quorum of a public body, convening so that they can contemporaneously communicate, acting on matters within their jurisdiction, you have a public meeting. And that triggers the requirement, as I said before, if it's a public meeting, you have to give public notice 24 hours before the meeting took place. You have to, of the date, time, and place of the meeting, you have to let the public attend, and then you have to keep minutes of what actions you took. So it naturally leads us to the next question, well, what's a public body? So a public body is any legislative body, governing board, statutory board, or body. Typically, anything you can find in RSA Chapter 31 or RSA Chapter 41 or the Planning and Zoning Statutes, RSA 674, which define public bodies, select board, trustees of trust fund, 
uh, cemetery trustees, planning board, zoning board of adjustment, et cetera, et cetera. Those are clearly understood and no one would disagree that they're anything other than public bodies. But you can also have a public body that is created by a statutory board or body. So the select board could create a subcommittee for the purposes of acting on something within the select board's jurisdiction. So for instance, my wife was asked to be a participant on a subcommittee of the Bow Planning Board that was looking into trying to develop a more aesthetically pleasing set of town signs that would be posted at town facilities, cemeteries, ball fields, etc. to make them all look aesthetically pleasing and have a, a similarity of appearance. And so they appointed a, uh, a committee of citizens. My wife was, was, at, was at the time the president of the Garden Club, so they assumed she had some sense of, of beauty that she could bring to the task of trying to better design the signs in the town of Bow. So that committee uh, appointed to the, the sign beautification committee by the select board, all of those members of the, of the sign committee were uh, members of a public body, and that subcommittee created by the select board was a public body. And that select board, that subcommittee had to comply with the right to know law. So for instance, this is an example of another public body that the town of Bow select board created. So back in, 19, in, in 2008, our town um, began the process of trying to uh, uh, find uh, the way to finance and uh, get <coughs> built a new public safety building. And it took five town meetings to finally agree to the amount the town meeting was prepared to spend on the new public safety building. I'm sure this sounds like a, a, a similar story. So the, actually the, the project started at 12 million and eventually got built for 4 million. But that's how things go. So during the process of trying to get the public safety building passed by the town meeting, the select board created what's indicated here is the public safety committee. And it was made up of both citizens and non-citizens, engineers and others. It was a public body. That public body, whenever it met, had to give notice of its meetings, had to let the public participate, and uh, had to keep minutes of its meetings. So it's, that's always important to keep in mind. You could have these subcommittees, which can be appointed by another public body, which have to comply with the right to know law. Um, one of the other things which is true about public meetings is that the statute contemplates there may be occasions because of circumstances that make it difficult for a member, member there's, it's impractical for a member to attend, that you might want to let that member participate by electronic means. So this was introduced into the statute in 2008, recognizing that the dawn of our much more efficient technological age sometimes merits the use of that technology to let a member participate electronically when they cannot practically be present. So when would that be likely the case that this could allow a public body to allow it? Well, this is all found in RSA 91-A, colon 2, Roman 3. So a public body, first of all, as the slide indicates, has to vote, yes, we're going to let someone participate electronically. So if a member of the cemetery trustees cannot be present for a critical meeting, maybe it's the time when the cemetery trustees are going to develop their budget for the following year, and one member is um, away in Missouri taking care of a sick relative, that member could be allowed to participate electronically as long as the rest of the cemetery trustees vote, yes, we'll let that member to participate electronically. But there are a couple of things that have to be true. Um, a, it has to be fact that the personal attendance is not reasonably practical. So there has to be some intervening circumstance that make that person unavailable for the regular meeting here in the town of Hampton or whatever the case may be. There has to be a quorum present of the public body physically at the place where the meeting is taking place. So if you have a cemetery trustees of three, you'd have to have two cemetery, cemetery trustees in the room, and the, uh, the third one is taking care of the sick relative in Missouri. Um, everyone who is at that meeting must be able to hear the remotely participating member. So the speakerphone has to be loud enough so everyone can hear that member participating by speakerphone and vice versa. The person who is participating from Missouri has to hear everyone in the room. And all votes must be by roll call vote. So it is um, a concession to some degree that the legislature has uh, given to public bodies to allow them some flexibility to let some members participate electronically. The next thing that I think it is, is merits attention to is what does open to the public mean or what does public attendance mean? Well, um, it means, in short, anybody can attend your public meetings. 
and it's not just residents of the town of Hampton. It's, it's any person, and that person could be even a non-citizen. So anyone is allowed to attend your meetings. Um, but that attendance does not mean they have the right to speak. They only have the right to attend. They have the right to record. They can photograph. They can videotape. I've told this story many times before. I used to go to a public meeting where someone would come in the audience and he would very loudly announce, I'm live tweeting this event out to the internet. And we said, oh, okay, that's great. And so, and people could live stream your meetings. Uh, there are, I've had this question many times, uh, Mr. Buckley, somebody's been uh, videotaping our meetings and they're posting those meetings on the internet, on YouTube. And I said, yes, that's what they can do. You have no control over that. Um, so all of those attributes of public participation include that ability to record uh, and uh, for, pos for their posterity's purposes uh, what took place in your public meeting. But there's no right to speak. There's nothing in the right to know that says a public, the public has a right to speak at your meetings. However, it is the case that many boards and bodies have a public comment period. It makes a lot of sense. You want to hear from the citizens. What do they have to say on something? Very common. I've been to many different public bodies. One, the Bell Planning uh, board, uh, School Board had a process where they took public comment halfway through the meeting and they took public comment at the end of the meeting. Um, so if you have a public comment period, there are a couple of rules of the road you have to keep in mind. Um, and it touches on some very uh, detailed rulings that attach to things related to the First Amendment and free speech. So whenever you're dealing with free speech, again, one of those constitutionally based rights, maybe the, one of the most cherished constitutionally based rights is the freedom of speech, the courts have developed very, very detailed and ornate rules to make sure government does not infringe on free speech. When it comes to public meetings, and this is true of many other areas of free speech regulation by municipalities, you can regulate the time, place, and manner of regulation. And the key thing, if you're going to let public participation have is to have rules, and in the rules will be rules or procedure. Public comment period will be as follows. It will be starting at a certain point in the agenda. Anyone can speak for no more than, I would say three minutes, but it could be five minutes. You could say in your public comment rules um, that you have to speak on something that's on the agenda, although um, you probably should also have a safety valve in your rules that says if someone wants to speak on something not on the agenda, they can do so as long as they get uh, prior approval. And that approval really shouldn't be a type of approval that makes someone impossible to speak on a subject that they want to speak on, even though it may not be within the germane to the activity of that particular board. So yes, you can limit to agendas, items, but the public comment period probably should also give the opportunity for speech on broader subjects. Um, now, this ability to attend a meeting does not give the public the right to disrupt the activity of government and to prevent the government from carrying on its job. And there's a very important case that makes very clear what chair people of public bodies have a certain authority. And, and this is similar to the authority a town moderator has at town meeting. And the case is entitled State versus Dominic. And it's interesting because it was actually a select board member who was being obstinate at a public meeting. It was a select board member of three, and one select board member um, was kept interrupting the chair while the chair was doing some business or hearing from a member of the public, and that select board member who was interrupting kept interrupting. He was told to stop interrupting. He's preventing the business of the meeting from being going, going forward and getting completed. And after he was told three or four times to stop interrupting, stop interrupting the flow of business, the chair said, look, if you keep interrupting me, I'm going to have this police officer remove you from the meeting because you're interrupting the flow of of the business and you can't do that because government has to be able to cl complete these agendas and you're preventing us from doing it. And of course he kept piping up and eventually the select board member was arrested and carted out of the room. And of course he sued the town saying he was in, he has right, free speech under the First Amendment infringed and ultimately the Supreme Court in our state said no, no, there are limits to free speech. And one of those limits is you cannot use speech to prevent government from doing its job, from getting a, a, the business of a meeting going forward and getting completed. So um, that kind of speech, and even repetitive speech, is not protected speech. Now, there are other forms of speech that are not protected. There's a famous case in New Hampshire uh, rose out of a, a, a bit of a, 
uh, kerfuffle in downtown Duff, Dover during the 1940s, uh, Chaplinsky versus uh, New Hampshire, where Mr. Chaplinsky was arrested when he was standing on a soapbox and he was calling people fascists. But more importantly, he was calling people fascists and then he was he was suggesting to people in the audience, if you don't agree with me, let's go out in, into the street and have a fight about it. And so the case came down to whether or not the instigation to fights to someone, that kind of uh, speech is protected speech, and it turns out under Chaplitsky versus New Hampshire, no, fighting words are not protected speech. Obscene speech is not protected speech. However, a tricky part of that is there's a number of cases that, that protect certain kinds of speech. There's a famous case from California, Cohen versus California, where a draft protester uh, had a T-shirt that had on the front of the T-shirt, F-U-C-K, the draft. And so he took that T-shirt, he wore it, and he walked into a courtroom in Los Angeles County. And he got arrested for disturbing the peace of the courtroom. Now, mind you, the evidence was he just walked into the courtroom and sat down. And the bailiffs of court took umbrage to his wearing of that T-shirt in the courtroom and arrested him. And ultimately, Justice Black said, no, that's protected speech. He was expressing an idea. So um, probably the case that someone uses a couple of four-letter words and emphasizing a point during a public comment period would not be obscene speech. But at some point, it may be objectionable, especially if it's repetitive, where you can say, okay, that's enough. Uh, you're, you're, we're done with listening to you. So again, I just want to emphasize, if you're going to have a public comment period, key thing is have written rules. Limit the period of time people can speak to no more than, I would say, three minutes. Uh, make sure that it, you presumptively encourage or require they attend, uh, uh, address something on the agenda. Uh, and if they want to talk about something not on the agenda, they have to get permission to do so. Some rules of the road when you're talking about the open to the public requirements of the right to know law. Now, there are some things which are clearly not a meeting. So I think uh, the chair mentioned that after we're done with this meeting today, uh, we're going to convene in a non-meeting for the purpose of consulting with counsel. So I'm legal counsel. In part, my job as uh, the New Hampshire Municipal Association, I provide legal counsel to all of our members. So you can consult with me and have an attorney-client relationship, and that relationship can be confidential. And as a consequence of the attributes that the relationship between an attorney and a client are confidential, when you communicate with, a, with an attorney in a contemporaneous fashion in a meeting, which we would have after the close of this meeting, that's an attorney-client meeting, and it is not something which is subject to the right to know law. It's a non-meeting, which gets confusing, but you hear about meetings, non-meetings, and non-public sessions. But the key thing to keep in mind is it's not a meeting subject to the right to know law when you meet with a lawyer. If you have a social or other encounter, that's not a meeting. So if your select board once a year has a Christmas party where all the members of the select board are there and they're not there talking on matters within their jurisdiction, they're not talking about a welfare application or an abatement application, they're just having a social occasion, that's not a meeting and it's not subject to the right to know law. Uh, when you have collective bargaining uh, discussions between labor and management, that's not a meeting. So there are certain things the statute recognizes are not subject to the right to know law. Email can be a devilishly tricky area of the law to deal with. And so I want to spend a little time about email and whether or not it would constitute an electronic meeting. So it, it bears repeating what happened to the poor town of Sandwich, where um, what, uh, without getting into great detail what happened to the town of Sandwich, which took place in 2015, let's just uh, say generally there was a very aggressive potential applicant to the ZBA who had not even filed an application with the ZBA yet, but was about to file an application with the ZBA. But he took it upon himself to prepare a packet of information he wanted the ZBA to see, and he prepared those envelopes, addressed it to all the CBA members, and had it mailed out to them. The ZBA chair became aware that this packet was on the way by the U.S. mail to all the members of the ZBA. He was concerned, actually legitimately so, that somehow getting that information, even before the board had had application before it, might put the board in the position of prejudging the merits of the application. And boards who act in a quasi-judicial capacity like a ZBA, they really have to avoid prejudgment. So the ZBA chair really was concerned, hey, let's not have the board uh, prejudge what might come in as an application. 
So he sends an email to all the members of the ZBA. Now, the, prob the first problem with his email was he put all of their email address in the to section of the email program. So, as we all know, if you hit reply all, everyone who gets the email would then get the reply sent by anyone who got that email. And what that created, or could have created in that particular circumstance, but the facts don't bear it out, but nonetheless, a Superior Court judge saw it otherwise, um, it created the opportunity for a contemporaneous communication by members, of the, uh, by a quorum of a public body. Of course, all taking place electronically out there in the internet ether, where no member of the public can see what's going on. So it would be presumptively illegal if such a, a communication took place. And the judge went to the extent saying, just by sending the email to all the members of the ZBA, it created the opportunity, the possibility there could be a contemporaneous communication. Because all that had to happen was one member of the ZBA hitting reply all and saying, I've read the packet, and I think Mr. So-and-so is full of malarkey. And that would have created a communication by the ZBA on matters within its jurisdiction, presumably the, the packet contains matters involving a ZBA application, a variance, or special exception. So when a Superior Court judge got a hold of what happened, and in fact, nobody actually replied. The only thing, person who replied was a member of the ZBA who sent an email back to the person who sent the applicant, who, the person who sent the materials, and said, stop doing that. Uh, basically admonishing him that you don't send packets to the ZBA. You, you only deliver information to a ZBA at a public meeting. So there really was no contemporaneous communication on matters within the ZBA's jurisdiction, but nonetheless, Superior Court judge says, well, yep, but it could have been. That's enough. It's a violation of the law. That, along with a lot of other unfortunate circumstances involving the town of Sandwich, ultimately resulted in the Superior Court finding in favor of the plaintiff saying the town violated the right to know law, and um, the court, as the court can do, awarded attorney's fee to the prevailing side. And it was an eye-whopping, uh, a, a huge amount, $200,000, that was assessed against the town of Sandwich. Now, the case has settled since, and I can't bore you with the details of that, but it points out that there's a great deal of difficulty that can arise when you have communications by email to a quorum of a public body. But that does not mean you cannot use email. So I have a couple of things, some rules of the road for public bodies and emails that I think bear attention. Number one, if you're going to use email, never express ideas, concerns, opinions on issues related to the business of the public body. Keep such communications to very narrow, non-business topics. Are we meeting tonight? Is the meeting canceled? Uh, attached is the packet without any expression of the opinion of something that's going on before the public body. That's, that's number one. Number two, if you have to distribute something by email to a quorum of a public body, have your administrative person at town hall do it. Um, not a member of the public body itself. Number three, put all the recipient's email addresses in the BCC line. Okay, so you got the email, it's the two, CC, and then you actually have to, sometimes you have to drop down and say BCC. If you put all their email addresses in that section of the email program, when it gets sent out, the recipient only looks like they're the sole recipient of the email. And if I get that email, I hit reply, it only goes back to the original sender. It does not go to everyone else. So it's one safeguard to prevent a contemporaneous communication because if it's sent by BCC, no one has all the email addresses available to them so they can hit reply all. Um, and if possible, if the town has the ability to provide you this kind of uh, this opportunity to communicate through a, an official email address, that's the better way to go. So you have a domain name that's been assigned to the town by ICANN or Network Solutions. It's townofhamptonnh.org or whatever it is. I, unfortunately, I don't know it off the top of my head. But you have a domain name. That domain name is a, a, you through your ISP and the ho people that host your website, they give you a certain number of email mailboxes. And you can create, you know, stevebuckley at hamptonnh.org, whatever the case may be. 
Uh, now, most of them are probably used up by town employees, but you could, if you have a number of available, and sometimes your ISP can give you 50 to 100 e email addresses, you could assign an official email address to either members of certain significant boards or bodies like the select board and or the planning board or the ZBA so that you have an official email account. And there's a good reason for that because then if, a, if official communication does go on, at a minimum, the town then has control over the content because one of the other attributes of the right to know law is you're obligated to keep public records available for public inspection. If people are communicating by email using some third-party email program, the electronic copies of those emails aren't necessarily contained within the town server. However, if they're coming through your server, through your domain name, they're going to be copied into your email program. It could be Exchange Server or other pro program where they're going to be archived for permanent uh, availability or retention. So that's one thing to keep in mind if you have that facility. And if, if possible, at least perhaps the, the, the chair of the uh, particular board or body would be able to be given an official email address. If you can't do that, one of the things I always urge people to do, if for some reason you find yourself in need of communicating uh, by email, you're a member of a public board or body, and you don't have an official email account, you have to send an email that has an official attributes or some official business, don't use your personal email account. Create a Gmail account just for public business. So Steve Buckley at the planning board at gmail.com, whatever the case may be. So you can get you know a free Gmail account, and you're not going to then mix up any public business you're having on email with your private email. Because I, I mean, I had a situation where a member of the select board was doing public business on her personal email account, and she left the select board. She was and her term was over, but it someone came to the town and said, "I want a copy of all my emails from this person to that person, including the select board member." And so we had to go back to the select board member because we didn't have control over her email account. We had to go back to her and say, would you please provide us access to these emails? Would you please search your in inbox for certain keywords so we can p comply with this right to know law request? Now, she could have been obstreperous and said, no, I won't do it. And then we would have had some legal process to force her. But you don't want to expose your personal email account to that situation if you can avoid it. So... If you can't get an official email address from the town, create one just for public purposes. I think it's going to make your life a lot easier in the long run. Um, so a public body quorum meeting on matters within this jurisdiction you're convening, uh, you have to give public notice. So what are the requirements? Well, the basic requirement is you have to give notice 24 hours beforehand in two public places, one of which could be the town's website. Um, you... Uh, can have a, a situation where you have to meet in a period of time less than 24 hours, which, by the way, 24 hours minimum does not include Sundays and holidays. So exclude Sundays and holidays from the 24 hours. So if you're posting on Saturday for a meeting, you have to, and you want to meet on Monday, you got a problem. Well, you can just make it. That's really close, but so you have to just exclude Sundays and holidays from the counting of the 24-hour minimum. You can also have a situation where you have an immediate need for public uh, public meeting because of an emergency. If that occurs, you can have a meeting with less than 24 hours notice because the bridge has been washed out and we've got to get together with the public works department and the police department and convene a meeting of the public safety uh, emergency management team and the select board is a quorum of that team and they have to be all together at the same place and time and it's less than 24 hours notice. You still post notice and you may include notice on your website, but it's less than 24 hours, and then you limit your discussion to the a matter that was the emergent issue. You don't talk about other stuff. You, li you limit it to that. Um, you have to give meetings. Uh, is that your water, Mark, or could I uh, sip up uh, this next one? Oh, there we go. Wet my whistle. So you have to keep uh, minutes of your public meetings. As I said before, you have to give notice. You have to give public participation. You have to keep minutes. So minutes have to be kept and made available within five day business days of the completion of the public meeting. A couple of things that you should keep in mind. Um, the contents of minutes are not as elaborate as maybe you expect them to be. It's actually pretty simple. You have to give the names of the people present, the names of other people participating. So typically that would mean 
you could have 30 people in the audience, five select board members, and only three people participate, come up to the microphone to speak. Those are the people you have to identify in your minutes. You have to keep a brief summary of the subject matter discussed and any final decisions reached. That's the simple, basic right to know law those were minutes have to contain. Um, sometimes, however, you stu certain times you have to have a roll call vote, and that would be going into non-public session, and we'll get to that in a second, but typically that's all that has to be present in your meeting minutes. Now, um, realistically, most boards and bodies are not going to meet within five business days of the original meeting and have a chance to look at the minutes and approve them. In fact, the right to know law has nothing in it that says minutes have to be approved. So, although many boards think, well, I don't want our minutes to become public until they've been approved by us, or at least we've been reviewed by us. And realistically, unless you're going to meet within five business days of your meeting that you just concluded then you have the minutes produced, you can't. So you really have to set up a system where someone in the room is going to be assigned the task to draft your minutes. It could be a member of the public body, preferably not. It could be a minute taker or some other person who works for the town. That person is going to produce your minutes at some point or along the way you'll develop a relationship and understanding between the board and what that person produces, but that person is going to produce those minutes within five business days. Those are your minutes. Uh, now, does it mean you have to approve those minutes? Well, again, the right to know law doesn't say you have to approve minutes. It just says you have to produce them within five business days. So how do you deal with trying to get the minutes approved and getting the input from the board who actually did the meeting? Because there could be legitimate need, need and reason to uh, reflect amendments or clarifications based upon what was prepared by the person who took them for you in the first place. Um, and so one approach we, we, can, we recommend is the minutes you would produce in five business days, you would mark draft. You could even mark draft until approved by the board. And then at your next meeting, so if your meeting was on February 20th and your next meeting is on March 20th, at the meeting on March 20th, you would have the minutes from February 20th before you. And the approach we think makes the most sense is that if a member of the board says, well, I want to approve the minutes with some changes, the changes that are then noted are not to the minutes that were marked draft approved, you would note the changes in the minutes of that meeting of March 20th. So you would say in the March 20th meeting, you know, Mr. Buckley made an amendment to uh, change the, the, the draft minutes from uh, uh, February 20th to reflect he said uh, this rather than that, as the case may be. That change is, is then reflected in the minutes of March 20th. So you, in order to see the entire content of the meeting, you would have to get the first set of minutes marked draft and then uh, the minutes which are uh, uh, produced uh, from the me meeting on March 20th. And you'd have to put the two together. Um, that's one approach. We think it's the best way to go because we would not encourage you to get rid of the draft minutes because they're public records. Um, and you would just need to record the changes from uh, the February 20th meeting and the, and the meeting of March 20th. So let's spend a little time on non-public sessions. And now um, it's suitable for you to... If you don't have it, I want to make sure you do have it. I'm going to be going over this checklist that was produced uh, by Cornell Johnson of our office. And we have found if you're going to comply with the right to NOLA in terms of non-public session, it's going to be best to follow the checklist. So before I get to the checklist, there's a couple of rules of the road I want to talk about. It's a non-public session. It's not a non-public meeting. There's no such thing as a non-public meeting. Every time you meet in a non-public session, you always start at a public meeting. So for instance, you could not convene in non-public session. You can only convene in public session and vote to go to non-public session. Public meeting, non-public session. Um, and a non-public session is different from a non-meeting. A non-meeting is something the law recognizes is not subject to the right to know law doesn't give the right to attend and of the public and the notice and et cetera. A non-public session is the exception, not the rule. It is, it's supposed to be the rare exception when there are unique circumstances dictated by the statute where a public body can meet in non-public session. And non-public sessions are permitted, but they're not required. And this is oftentimes a question we get, you know, and especially it comes up in the area of reputation, 91A3, 
uh, Roman 2, subparagraph 2, uh, Roman 2, uh, subparagraph C, you know, the reputation of someone not a member of the public body. And we can talk about that some more if you'd like. Um, that there is this concern that somehow any time someone has a concern that a discussion might harm someone's reputation, however slight, that somehow the person whose reputation is in jeopardy has a right to demand that they have a non-public session or that somehow a board is required. Well, we have to go in the non-public session, aren't we required to do that? Well, that's not the law. The law is if the public body decides, based on the law, a non-public session is merited, yes, you can go in the non-public session. So again, non-public sessions are permitted, but they're not required. So when is the more likely occasion we'd go into non-public session? Uh, so when you're hiring a public employee, and it's, by the way, hiring a specific public employee. Let's assume for a moment the select board wants to talk about generally the fact that we need to hire another police officer and we need to look for another police officer. Or we want to set up a procedure to, to hire a company to help find us a new police officer. That's not a discussion about the hiring of a particular person. It's only when you have five candidates before you. You've got to choose one of the five. Now you are discussing the potential hiring of a person to be a public employee. That's a public, uh, non-public session uh, opportunity. Uh, the other one, which is often re referred to and sometimes difficult to understand, is the dismissal, promotion, or compensation, investigation of charges, or discipline of a public employee. It has to be one of those attributes. And interestingly, not in this is what if you're just simply doing a review of someone's performance. Technically, you look at the statute, it doesn't say performance review is covered by a non-public session. Now, if you were coupling a performance review with a comp compensation review, yes, you could go in the non-public session. So non-public session would also be for the purpose of discussing um, the purchase of real or personal property where the interests of the public body are adverse to the interests of the public at, uh, the, the, the citizens at, at, at large. So easy example is the town wants to buy a piece of property. It has $100,000 in its pocket but doesn't want to offer $100,000 because they want to save twenty. So you go to the, the person who owns the property, offer them eighty. Now, you don't want to let that person know you're prepared to pay 100 because then you, you wouldn't get it for the cheaper price and save public dollars. So that's a, a subject you can discuss in non-public session where the interest of someone else is adverse to the community and you want to get a better price for the purchasing of uh, a piece of uh, property or personal property. If you want to discuss pending lawsuits, that is lawsuits which have been threatened in writing um, by a municipality against someone else or by someone against a municipality, that can be discussed in non-public session. You can discuss emergency preparations which are designed to thwart a imminent threat of terrorist attack, which is kind of a narrow circumstance. And you can also now go into non-public sessions and discuss legal advice. It's 91A3, Roman 2, subparagraph, small letter L. Um, and that allows you to go to non-public session to discuss uh, you know, that you've received legal advice orally in writing from your town attorney. So those are the, the, the bases for going in non-public session. So now what I want to do is to go through the form. And literally, if you follow the form, you're going to comply with the right to know law. So looking at the form, step one, you want to indicate on the form, and you can, and by the way, you can download this from our website. I can show you where it is and you can modify it for the name of your municipality and make it all work perfectly for you. So first you have to list who are the members present. Easy to do. Uh, you can then, in the same section, you can see a motion is made to non, go into non-public second and seconded by the person who's making the motion. That's requ actually required under the statute after a motion in the second. And then you would cite the specific statutory reason. Ideally what you would do on the form, you would check which one applies. So let's assume you're going to check 91A3, Roman 2B, the hiring of a person as a public employee. The person would read the motion accordingly, and they would check that box. Then um, you would have a roll call vote to enter non-public session. Again, you would list the names of all the members of the public body, yes, no, and then you would remove the tape. Continuing on to the second page, you then uh, would list, A, when you enter non-public session, 
and other persons who might be present during the non-public session. Let's talk about that for a second. Generally speaking, the only people in the non-public session should be the members of the public body. However, there may be times when you have to have others present. So if you had a town manager like Hampton does, town manager might be there to discuss the hiring process. You're in the middle of hiring someone, the town manager has essential information. Or you're in non-public session discussing buying a piece of property. The town engineer has to be there to talk about some of the attributes of that property and why you want to offer X, Y, or Z to the seller of the property. So there will be circumstances where people not members of the public are present. Generally, however, you want to limit those who are going to be in non-public to just the public body and those essential public employee or maybe consultants and others who may be necessary to help the board do its job. Then you have to prepare minutes, and the form for the minutes is right here. All you have to do is fill it out. So I wouldn't even bother to have a minute taker. You can just have someone write notes here. What has to be in the minutes? Well, the statute now requires you essentially to have the same information in non-public meeting minutes as required for regular meeting minutes. So you have to note um, the names of the members present, other people participating or attending, uh, a brief summary of the subject matter discussed and any final decisions reached or action taken. And that's the other thing that sometimes people get confused about. Can we vote in non-public session? Yeah, you can vote in non-public session. It actually now requires you, when you do vote in non-public session, that you have to be able to, as the statute say, um, indicate the, the manner in which each person voted. So it doesn't really explain, you know, as it says here, um, in, the voting information must be in such a manner that the vote of each person is ascertained and recorded. I think it's easier just to assume that in non-public session you're going to vote probably to do by roll call vote. So, excuse me, so if you had a non-public session where you had five candidates for the police officer position and you wanted to offer the position to candidate A but not to candidate B, C, D, or E, you could vote. We'll offer to candidate A and of course you want to keep that sealed because you then need to have the staff go out and make an offer to candidate A and make sure candidate A agrees and accepts the position before you give notice to candidates B, C, D, and E they didn't get the job because you may have to go back to candidate B, C, D, or E uh, if candidate A doesn't accept the job. And that's again, makes complete sense. And so you would record, you know, the select board was in attendance, they received a report from the town manager, it was recommended that you hired uh, candidate A, board voted by roll call vote to offer the job to candidate A, instructed the town manager to uh, take the necessary steps to make the offer. And you would write that out in this section of the materials. Uh, and then uh, you would make a motion after you've completed that non-public session, keeping in mind you're in non-public session, you want to limit your discussion to that very topic. I had an interesting conversation with a town, and I know this happens a lot. Uh, there was a situation where the, 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 the police department wanted to have a non-public session. They were urging the select board to have it. But the select board kind of figured out that they really didn't want to discuss the hiring of a police officer. They really wanted to get into the non-public session to discuss something else, which you're not supposed to do. You're supposed to limit your discussion in non-public session to the reason why you're in non-public session. If you go to the non-public session to discuss hiring of a, of a police officer or a public official or a, or, or a public employee, that's what you discuss. You don't discuss anything else. Once you stray from that topic, you're going to get in trouble. So you make your motion to go to leave non-public session, and that does not have to be a roll call vote. Uh, it has to either passes or doesn't. And then you uh, resume, you stop the non-public session and the uh, public recording, uh, and you move, the uh, non-public meeting tape is removed. If you keep one, I'm not sure it's a good idea to keep a, me a tape of a non-public session. And you indicate the time the public session is convened. And then the next section, was, which is important, is you then have to decide, do we have a basis to keep what we just created as a non-public session minutes <coughs> sealed? Now, the statute actually doesn't use the word sealed. What it says is, presumptively, everything done in non-public session must be recorded and must be made available to the public within 72 hours unless the public body determines one of three things. To release the information would adversely affect someone's reputation, or to release the information would render a proposed action ineffective, or the 
discussion pertained to the preparation of carrying out of actions regarding terrorism. So it, it's kind of a reverse kind of uh, approach to the concept of what you're supposed to do. What you're supposed to do is automatically release these minutes unless one of these conditions apply. So most of the time, you're going to find that a member of the board would make the following motion. Mr. Chair, I would move that we keep non-public the minutes we just completed of the recent non-public session because if we didn't, it would render ineffective or the proposed action ineffective. So someone has to make that motion, and then um, there has to be a roll call vote again. You have to record the roll call vote of those who are in attendance, yes or no. Um, so if you follow um, the checklist each and every time, and use the checklist not only to tell you what to do with regards to the non-public session, but to record your minutes, you're going to comply with the right to know law. Questions? This is not a group that's asking a lot of questions. I know I was just going to take general questions, but seeing none right now, we'll keep moving. Um, so I've kind of completed um, non-public sessions, but let me just say one more thing about um, uh, the, the fact that they're kept and made available within 72 hours. What, um, what's important to know um, is that 72 hours is a hard and fast deadline. A, they have to be produced within 72 hours, which is interesting because regular meeting minutes only have to be produced within five business days. This is 72 hours, have to be produced, unless you voted to keep them non-public. What do you do if you forgot to seal the non-public meeting minutes? Well, you won't forget if you follow the checklist every time. But okay, if you don't follow the checklist, which can happen, so what do you do? Well, one of the things which we think is true if you haven't hit the 72-hour time, you could reconvene and vote to seal the non-public minutes. Okay, that's fine. What happens if you hit the 72 hours, no one has asked for a copy of the minutes, so they haven't been made, and by the way, when we say made public, it, the statute actually uses the phraseology available to the public. So a set of non-public meeting minutes could be <clears throat> theoretically available to the public, they're sitting in a file, where someone could walk into the town hall and say, I want a copy. But no one does. So they're available, but they're not released. Could you, under those circumstances, they're available, but no one has asked for them yet, after the 72 hours have passed, reconvene and vote to seal the minutes after the 72 hours? And the answer is, maybe. <laughs> uh, it might work. I mean, I could see going to a Superior Court judge and saying, Your Honor, yeah, 72 hours have passed, but we have a good reason to keep these minutes non-public because it might cause my serious harm to reputation, and no one has asked for them yet. So they really haven't been out there in the public domain. That might work, but if you're going to be in that situation, you have a really serious situation, you have to talk with your town council. Yes? Um, if you're going to reconvene, you can only go in... Would you have to go to a non-public session to take a vote on whether or not to no. those No, no. You would first you would convene so a public you, session. So you would have to post. You'd picture. post for a public meeting, that, and you would say uh, we held a non-public session on this date. Of course, you're not going to discuss the content of the minutes, and you would then vote. You know, we didn't, and now we wish to vote to seal the minutes of that non-public session. So that would be all public session. There wouldn't be any need to convene a non-public session. Unless, perhaps, let's assume a member of the board had <coughs> concerns. Should we seal them or should we not? And you now need to discuss the content of what went on. That might merit going back in a non-public session to have that discussion. So you wouldn't inadvertently reveal the content of what took place. Uh, just to give you a break for a minute, Steve. Sure. You're about to go into governmental records. Um, and I think Steve covered very nicely the uh, gist of the Porter versus Sandwich case. For those of you who are gluttons for punishment, I have a copy of the Porter versus Sandwich decision from August of 2015. It's a Superior Court case out of Carroll County, and it is 47 pages long. And uh, it is, uh, it's an eye closer if you uh, go to read that at a certain amount of time. But 
I think the Superior Court judge realized that himself because on page three in footnote three, in talking about the personnel involved, he was talking about the town's administrative assistant who had been involved in the email in question and also the town's ZBA chair who was involved in the email. And, though, and so here in this footnote on page three, the judge says, although the timing is somewhat unclear, both Huff and Shambaugh stepped down from their positions after becoming engaged in a romantic relationship. <laughs> so this, uh, this was a patent place in the making. And I think that's what kept No, no, no that's Gilman. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, in any event, it, this, this opinion is the only one so far that uh, Steve and I have been able to uncover, uh, Superior Court or Supreme Court of New Hampshire, uh, that has directly encountered the situation of emails being used to express uh, opinions or directions and uh, in which the court uh, then applies the restrictions under the right to know law against contemporaneous communications outside of public meetings that Steve has discussed. Uh, this case was brought on appeal to the New Hampshire Supreme Court and within the last three months the appeal was uh, dropped. And so this is a final decision. It does not have the same precedential value as a Supreme Court decision Nevertheless, anyone who is in this field who uh, wants to uh, deal with the subject of emails and contemporaneous communication among board members uh, needs to be cognizant of the consequences of violating the right to know law by uh, communicating opinions outside of a public meeting among, among members. And so this is an important decision in that respect. As Steve mentioned, the consequences were pretty grave there because in addition to the $200,000 that the town of Sandwich had to pay to outside the counsel for Mr. Porter, the town also had to pay its own attorneys. And so you can imagine it was a, it's a pretty drastic thing. Uh, the 47 pages reflects how much time was put into this. And these, the emails involved were very few in number. Nevertheless, they were, uh, they expressed opinions. They, the court here found that they had the potential to influence the outcome when the bodies actually met, creating the potential for prejudice. And so this is what the court was uh, very concerned about. There are other things that happened, as you might imagine, among the 47 pages after the ZBA chairman sent out this, uh, this um, email directing uh, other uh, board of adjustment members uh, to destroy the packet unread. Eventually the case did come before uh, the ZBA on appeal in Sandwich and what happened there was the same uh, administrative assistant to the uh, uh, land use secretary sent out some proposed uh, a proposed ruling that the attorney for the board had drafted in advance. The court found that that too violated the right to no law, but uh, violated the separate section that had to deal with the, uh, uh, the right to no law in the sense of uh, communications outside a meeting uh, shall not be used to circumvent the spirit and purpose of the chapter. And that is a separate section that is RSA 91A2, colon, uh, colon 2, hyphen small a, requiring public bodies to deliberate on matters over which they have supervision, control, jurisdiction, or advisory power only in meetings held pursuant to and in compliance with the provisions of the public notice. So that's yet another aspect of that Porter versus Sandwich decision that's important. And uh, the fact that this suggested decision was sent out in advance of the meeting was held to uh, basically act as the expression of, of uh, the positions of the chairman who had met with the attorney and who had drafted this proposed decision. So uh, again, the, the focus of this is making sure that the, uh, the, the business of the, of the body is conducted publicly with the public present 
with this deliberations being conducted where everyone can see and, uh, and not outside of, of that public um, forum. And so that is the, the, uh, the importance of this sandwich decision. This is one that uh, when it came out, I have met a number of times with uh, the Selectman board, uh, board of Adjustment, the Planning Board, Budget Committee, Energy Committee, uh, and yet uh, it's, it's a subject that's still new uh, in and of itself in that other courts have not addressed it. But nevertheless, anytime someone finds an issue, they're going to go to this decision, and it would be cited if it goes to the Superior Court. And uh, Steve, I know you've got a slide coming up at some point that's going to talk about consequences for violating the right to yes. no law. And it's important because in, in this one, the town was ordered to pay those attorney's fees. The town, uh, the, the, uh, the board members involved were ordered to undergo remedial training. And the decisions that stem, that resulted from those violating emails were invalidated by the court. So all the time that they took to uh, actually deliberate, uh, when they did deliberate, went, went for naught because the decisions were invalidated. Uh, so it's an important decision to be aware of. Uh, it should, it can't be taken lightly, whether you would disagree or not with it. Um, and uh, the court will certainly, get, over time, I'm sure, address this area in greater detail, as perhaps the legislature may. But it's certainly an important decision, and that's why there's a copy uh, for uh, bedtime reading. Thank you, Mark. So uh, with that, that uh, kind of closes out the presentation on public meetings and non-public sessions. So now we're going to move on to governmental records, um, which I just want to point out, <clears throat> these are slides we've, we've been using in our program for local officials workshop. And if you came to the local official workshop, you would get our 400-page chock-a-block book on municipal law for, for municipal officials called Knowing the Territory. Free! So, uh, so I know you've paid for it, I know that, but, so, so don't forget that there is a workshop you can still go to in Stratum on the 23rd uh, and at uh, NHMA uh, on June 3rd. So, uh, with that, governmental records. Uh, so, governmental records. You start by asking, what is a governmental record? So it's any information created, accepted, or obtained by or in behalf of a public body or a quorum thereof or a public agency in furtherance of its public, a public uh, official function. It includes any form of communication. So it could be electronic, uh, it could be a text, it could be an email, uh, as long as it's some physical form received by a quorum or majority of a public body. It is a governmental record. And so a letter received by one select board member is not a public record. If the letter is then circulated by that select board member to the rest of the select board, it's a public record. It has to be, however, something within the furtherance of the governmental function. So if a select board member got a birthday card from a constituent and passed it around to the rest of the select board, it's not a governmental record because it wasn't uh, for in furtherance of a governmental uh, a, a, a purpose. Uh, interesting case that came up a couple of years ago, and I just mentioned it uh, to indicate the importance that it has to be. It has to have some physical form. I represented a town where a, a building inspector uh, was called by a neighbor of of uh, to a, a subject property, and the subject property was an apparently legal junkyard. So the neighbor dropped a dime, I guess you would say, in in, in the in the, the street jargon and call the building inspector and say, hey, my neighbor's running a junkyard. Now, the, uh, the building inspector did not write down the neighbor's name or telephone number. He just wrote down the address of the subject property and went out and inspected and then sent a, a, a uh, non-compliance letter and, and enforcement action. Of course, the property owner owned the subject property called up and said, who dropped the dime on me? And so the building inspector said, well, I remember the guy's name and I remember uh, his address, but I didn't write it down. And I said, great, it's not a public record. It's in your brain, so you don't have to rep produce anything to the person who's asking for it. So don't worry about it. Don't tell him who you talked to who complained about the fact that there was an illegal junkyard. 
Um, so uh, you also have a lot of ways in which the, the statute lists out exemptions to what are not governmental records. So pretty much any written record is a governmental record unless it's exempt from disclosure. And 91-A colon 5 lists a series of exemptions from uh, disclosure of non-public records, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. But in addition to the statute listing out things which are not subject to disclosure, uh, and I guess, again, it's important to understand, every written record received by a public agency, and that's the town manager to the select board to the, uh, the community development department, it's all that stuff you have at town hall, it's in your server, it's in text messages, anything, any piece of paper, it's all public records. Those are all governmental records. Um, but then there's a whole carve out from that big, large universe of public records which are not subject to disclosure. They're governmental records, but they're exempt from disclosure. 91-A lists a number of those, which we'll probably spend most of our time on. But there are other statutes which provide exemptions to the right to know law. Uh, in fact, one that's been hotly debated recently, it's RSA 40, uh, 260 colon 14. That statute presumptively says that all accident reports prepared by a police department are exempt from disclosure of the right to know law. There's actually activity at the state house to say, wait a minute, we can deliver accident reports to people at town hall who are people who are in the accident, et cetera. So there are other statutory ways in which the legislature is exempt in certain public records from disclosure. Interestingly, uh, the list of licensed dog owners uh, under RSA 466-1-D is not a public record. Unemployment records are not public records. Welfare records, that is people who receive local assistance are not public records. So there are a number of places where you have to also turn to to determine whether the record is subject to disclosure. In addition to 91-A-5, which lists out, again, a number of exemptions, we also have case law, which either exempts out statutes or gives us standards upon which we judge whether a record is subject to disclosure. One of those is called the Freedom of Information Act Murray test. So back in the 1970s, it was discovered that there were a, a host of um, records maintained by police departments which legitimately had to be kept non-public. And our Supreme Court incorporated a set of standards from the Freedom of Information Act in a case entitled Murray, and that's why it's called the Murray test, where if you meet certain tests as a law enforcement record, it's not subject to disclosure. And a law enforcement record is very simply something kept by a law enforcement agency, if it's a law enforcement agency and it keeps the record, and the record would uh, reveal the name of a confidential source or would invade someone's privacy, it's not subject to disclosure. Um, so the principal statute that we spend a lot of time trying to understand and interpret for our, our municipal clients is Roman 4 of RSA 91-A colon, uh, colon 5. And it says, and this is the entire, the entire pertinent part of the paragraph, certain records are not subject to disclosure, as the statute says, including under Roman 4, records pertaining to personal, internal personnel practices, confidential commercial or financial information, test questions, scoring keys, examination data, uh, et cetera, et cetera, personnel, medical, welfare, library user videotape, or other files whose disclosure would constitute invasion of privacy. Uh, what is important about this language in the recent case law that in interprets it uh, is um, the fact that up until recently, the phrase internal personnel practices had a very, very narrow meaning. It meant if a town or a city had undertaken an internal investigation, typically it would be by the police department against one of its police officers alleged to have committed a crime in the course of uh, being a police officer. The internal investigation unit would undertake an investigation and possibly prosecute the crime by the police officer. That's what had been the limited scope of definition for an internal personnel practices. That has now changed as a result of some recent cases by the Supreme Court to broaden the concept of internal, per, internal personnel practices, that it's something internal to the community's active handling of its personnel, and it has to be a practice, which seems kind of easy to understand, but it took a long time for the Supreme Court to finally realize, as long as it's internal to the personnel relationship of the municipality, 
uh, that the employer-employee relationship exists and something we're doing dealing with employee-employer relationships, that's an internal personnel practice. But more importantly, the court has also recently addressed whether or not uh, under a case that came down from the town of uh, the city of Dover, Clay versus the city of Dover, whether or not scoring sheets that were used by the superintendent's subcommittee, they had a search committee created by the city of Dover to look for a superintendent, and they had a search committee create a rubric that was used to score whether or not certain candidates may, met certain attributes. And uh, Mr. Jeffrey Clay, who is often a, a litigant in right to no cases, uh, uh, made a, a claim for the right to get those scoring sheets even before the scoring process and the hiring of the superintendent had been completed. Um, and the Supreme Court ultimately agreed, based upon a case decided in December, Reed versus the New Hampshire Attorney General, uh, and then this uh, case came down subsequent to that, Clay versus the city of Dover, which said, yes, a scoring sheet that is used for the purpose of determining whether or not a, a candidate had certain attributes which would justify that person being, hari being hired was uh, a personnel record which would be whose uh, disclosure would constitute an invasion of privacy. And as a consequence, the case has been sent back to the Superior Court to determine whether those records are truly ones which would cause an invasion of privacy. And, and would be, make sense because if you've been a, a, an applicant for a job uh, such as superintendent, and there's five people who are, have applied for the job, and all five of you have been ranked, but you already have a job with someone else, and you don't want your current employer to know you're applying for another job, you might very well want to know that your ability to apply is going to be kept confidential so you don't harm your relationship with your current employer. So it's a naturally understood need of the person applying not to have the inadvertently or advertently the information about their applying for another job disclosed. So that was one of the things the courts have wrestled with recently. But the court has also addressed this other part of the statute, which is the one which we also spent a lot of time on, any files whose disclosure would constitute an invasion of privacy. And what the court has done is, through a number of cases, and in particular Lammy versus the Public Utilities Commission, they have kind of set up a set of, set of standards where it tries to determine, uh, well, um, what is the public interest in the record? Uh, what is the private interest in the record? So you look at the public interest, and typically when you're looking at the public interest of should the public be allowed to get access to a record, you're trying to, to, to evaluate, well, how does that record tell us what government is doing? How does it tell us about governmental operations? So that's, that's the one thing you begin to weigh, and then you determine, well, that's the public interest, then what's the private interest? Uh, and the, the, if there's an interest in the person whose information is being disclosed, which has an invasion of privacy, that person has an interest in protecting that information, such as, let's like, say, uh, an unlisted telephone number or a social security number or things like that. And then you d d d determine, after you've looked at the public interest and the private interest, uh, does the public interest outweigh the private interest? And in the Lamy case, the New Hampshire Utilities Commission had undertaken an investigation about whether a particular utility had, in a timely fashion, responded to electrical outages. And they had done a, the Utilities, Public Utility Commission had gathered information conducted by the, one of the utilities of the survey of, of those who were affected by an outage and how quickly they got their power back on. Um, and when a competing utility request, requested that data, um, the, the competing utility wanted that survey information and the names and addresses of the customers who were affected. So the question was whether the customers whose personal names and addresses were going to be disclosed to, this cust to the other competitor, whether there was a sufficient public interest that outweighed the privacy interest of protecting their names and addresses from disclosure. Mind you, and one of the things the court has recognized, even though you could probably get their names and addresses from other sources in the public, People still have a, an inherent need to protect their privacy, and there's another standard the court has adopted that's called the practical obscurity test, which means we have a, an expectation to protect uh, our uh, the attributes of our personhood, our names, our addresses, our family members, all those things that go into who we are as people, we have a right to protect that information, even if that information can be found otherwise in the Internet. So ultimately the Supreme Court said, well, the applicant here, the other utility, wants this information about what the Public Utilities Commission did in gathering this data from the utility that had the outage. 
So the information that the company wants doesn't tell us anything about what the PUC did or, did or didn't do. It's talking about what the other utility did, did or didn't do. So it didn't tell anything about the activities of government. So ultimately, the privacy interest was weighed on the, on the part of the, uh, the residential customers who shouldn't have their personal information revealed, especially in light of the fact that revealing the information wouldn't aid us in understanding what the PUC is doing. Because it's not the PUC who should turn the lights off. It was the other utility. And those are some of the standards the court looks at in, in, in evaluating whether certain records are exempt. I had another one that I had uh, for a town that um, had a, a, a sewer utility that employed what's called an industrial discharge permit system. I don't know if you have, if you have a sewer utility here in the town, but if you do, uh, towns that have sewer utilities are required by the Department of Environmental Services and EPA to have industrial discharge permits. So an industrial user has to give you very detailed information of that, the stuff coming from that manufacturing facility into your waste stream. And it's called the industrial discharge permit. And it's a very carefully regulated manner of ensuring the, 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 the water going into the water streams are uh, of the type that would be allowed based upon the permitting for that particular sewer plant. Um, so the town that I represented received a request, a right to know request, from a company that was a competitor of the company that had the discharge permit. Both companies were in the uh, business of doing um, high-tech computer, uh, computer board manufacturing. So the target company who was the one who had the permit had provided all these detailed chemical formulas of the constituents in their waste stream. Their competitor wanted that information because that would tell them uh, unique information about their particular manufacturing process which would perhaps give them a competitive edge. So ultimately when the request came to me I said no, that's confidential information, commercial information we received which would, if disclosed, would be harmful to the company that was a utility user in our town. Another example of what would be considered exempt information. Preliminary drafts, notes, and memoranda, and other documents not in their final form and not disclosed, circulated, or available to a quorum of the public body uh, is not a public record. So if I've prepared a draft or proposed amendment to the zoning ordinance as the community development director, and I even delivered that zoning ordinance amendment to the entire quorum of the planning board for public hearing, it's not a public record. It only becomes a public record when that draft is then made available for a quorum of a public body. And notes and memoranda, other documents which are not intended to become public records are not in, are not in fact documents which are subject to disclosure. So I'm, I'm, if I'm a member of a public body and I'm keeping my own personal notes, those are not public records subject to disclosure under the right to know law. Um, now, as I said before, there's a whole array of uh, standards which have been set forth by the Supreme Court using standards from the Freedom of Information Act which say that certain records are not subject to disclosure because they are free of law enforcement records. And the court listed out a number of factors. But the first thing you have to have, it has to be a law enforcement record. And a law enforcement record has to be prepared by a law enforcement agency, typically an agency that is enforcing laws that has the power to cite someone for a criminal statute and have it prosecuted by the local county attorney or city attorney. Yes? Um, just going back one step, um, something I'm very confused about is what is considered a quorum? Because a majority, the public, a, a majority of a public body. Okay, so if there are 12 people on my board. You have a 12-member board. And I speak to one. That's one to one. That's or I text whatever. Well, okay, let's just do it this way. If you're a member of a public body, you should avoid putting things and writing to each other on matters within your jurisdiction. So you have 12 members on your board, so a quorum would be seven and if seven members are communicating on matters within its jurisdiction you have a public meeting okay so let's assume for a moment you're a member of that public body of 12 and you call uh, a fellow member and say hey I, I want to talk to you about what we're going to vote tomorrow night that's not a that's not a violation of the right to know law okay now 
if you then create a conference call where you add six more members on that discussion, you might have an improper illegal meeting. But more problematic, the statute also makes clear that if you have a sequential series of communications, you might also trigger a violation of the right to know law. So let's assume for a moment you call up your member A, you call member B and say, hey, let's vote no on some part of what's before us. And then you, you say to member B, why don't you call C and say the same thing? And then B calls C, and you do a series of sequential communications. That kind of sequential communication could trigger a conclusion that was a, that was a violation of the right to know law. So really, as much as possible, you should try to limit your discussions outside of a meeting to non-substantive matters. And when you're in a public meeting, that's where you discuss, should we vote for this proposition or not? But at least, the, I mean, if I'm talking to one or two people, I'm okay. You, you are not technically violating the law, that's correct. Okay. But if then, if it continues through a series of right. sequential communications, you could, you could trigger a finding that's a violation of the right to know law. Thank you. Um, so, a law enforcement record has to be created by some <laughs> agency that's in the law enforcement business, and there was a case that came down about this involving the, the um, fire marshal's office. The fire marshal's office was argued to be a law enforcement agency, and they didn't want to release a, release a particular fire investigation, what's called a cause and origin report on the origin of a particular fire. So the question the Supreme Court had to resolve was the uh, fire marshal's office law enforcement and ultimately the court said yes they do enforce these laws involving the investigation of cause and origin of fires and have the power to cite people for violation of certain state building codes therefore therefore they were a law enforcement agency once you've satisfied that requirement under the the standards you could uh, determine that that law enforcement record would not be disclosed so long as you meet any one of these factors so you could have factor a release would interfere with the law enforcement proceeding, factor B would interfere with a fair trial, invasion of privacy, release confidential sources, disclose investigative techniques. These are all standards that the court would under the Murray test say that record would not be subject to disclosure of the right to know law. Um, so there's a couple of areas that are, bear uh, attention. Uh, the two I want to mention here are raw materials to create, used to create minutes and settlement agreements. So raw materials, the stuff that are used to create minutes, are subject to disclosure. And the statute is kind of unique. It says the materials that are used by someone to create the minutes, that person's notes, the audio tape, the videotape, anything that goes into creating the minutes, all that stuff must be available for the public to look at up to the point that the minutes are created. So you've got five business days. Your secretary person who has done the minute note-taking, uh, let's say he has some personal notes, he has some documents that were discussed at the meeting, he has an audio tape, all of this stuff that the minute-taker is going to use to compile the minutes. If a member of the public comes in when that person isn't using those materials and says, I want to look at all of the raw materials that's going to go into making those minutes, the public has the right to look at that stuff. Um, once the minutes, however, are created, the notes and the audio tapes, for instance, tapes that you keep for the purpose of creating the minutes, if the town has a system of taping a minute, uh, taping minutes and then uh, having those tapes available, if you don't have, if you want to get rid of that tape, you're not required to keep it so long as the minutes are prepared and you have a regular practice of taking the tape and using it over again. The other one I want to point out here are settlement agreements for claims or lawsuits. Any time municipality settles a lawsuit of any type whatsoever, the settlement agreement and the records of the settlement agreement has to be kept on file at the town clerk's office. It's one of those unique requirements, and any uh, insurance company that represents a town knows they have to have these settlement documents on file at, at the town clerk's office. So. Once you've determined the record is a public record, it, most of the time it's going to be a public record, it's not exempt, you then have to decide what, are we, what steps are we going to take to disclose the public record. The first thing which is true is every citizen has a right during the regular business hours to go to your town hall and ask for public records. And 
those records should be available, made available for public inspection, assuming they're not needed by the public officials to do their job. So if someone comes into the town clerk's office and says, I want to look at the minutes from the town meeting of last year, presumably they could have picked up the town report and looked at it, but maybe they want to look at the original minutes, and the town clerk has them available in a file, they should be made available. And that member of the public has a right to not only inspect them, to but copy those public records and make abstracts of them. That's the essential right to access to public records. Anyone has the right during the normal business hours to request access to public records, to copy them, to make abstracts, and to just inspect. Um, and in fact, we've gone to the extent now where people can ask for electronic copies of those records. The right to know law says, um, presumptively, the records are supposed to be made available upon request. If for some reason a public body cannot make those records available upon request, what you're supposed to do is tell the person within five business days you will be given those records and when they'll be made available, assuming you can't make them available upon the day they request them. So they come in on, on the town hall on Friday and say, I want to look at um, a spreadsheet uh, that is not in electronic form and only being used right now by the finance department to create the budget for next year, and it's not really available for distribution, uh, the person can be told, uh, we can give that to you, but not today, and you're supposed to do that within five business days. So your obligation, if it's not immediately available, is to tell the person within five business days when it will be available and when they can come to town hall and inspect them. Um, you're not required to compile or create records that don't exist. So, um, for instance, the example I gave before about the building inspector who had in his re recollection the name and address of the person who dropped the dime on the neighbor who had the illegal junkyard, he's not required to create that record. It didn't exist. All records that uh, exist, or however, have to be produced. So one of the areas that we often get qu questions about is um, <clears throat> if someone sends me uh, a right to NOLA request and says, I want this document, this document, and this, this document, and then I want a series of questions answered. The right to NOLA does not require you to answer questions. Why did the select board do this? Or what's the select board's plan to do that? Or is the ZBA going to support the zoning amendment? Whatever the case may be, the right to NOLA does not require you to provide answers to questions. doesn't mean you shouldn't answer questions within the, the realm of what makes sense in terms of what you know and what you feel that you can give to the public that's reliable information at the time you have it, but it doesn't mean you're obligated on the right to know law to answer a series of questions. You're not required to respond, say, to interrogatories you, as you would in, uh, in, in superior court if you were in litigation. Um, the delivery of records are either delivered by pickup, by mail, or electronic distribution. The court has recently addressed the ability of people to get access to uh, electronic records, and this is through a number of cases involving SAU 55, where apparently there is a lot of issues involving electronic produ production of electronic records. Uh, in, the, in the Green versus SAU case, a member of the budget committee for the for the uh, SAU, the uh, 55, the Timberlane Regional School District, um, made a request to the superintendent's office for some public records. Uh, the superintendent's office said, "Yeah, sure, you can come to town hall, uh, come to the superintendent's <coughs> office to look at them." And so the member of the budget committee uh, contacted them back and said, "Well, let's not horse around. Why don't you just email them to me?" And the superintendent's office says, "No, we won't email them to you. We're not going to do that." Ultimately, the Supreme Court said. Even though it was not clear in the right to know law at the time the court visited this case, if an electronic record can be reasonably and practically sent to someone, a public body has a duty to provide the records electronically. You can't just say, I won't pr produce the records electronically. Now, the, the question now has become, <laughs> what is producing electric, electronic? What's the duty to produce the electronic records and how you have to produce them? And there's been a subsequent case involving the same SAU, Taylor versus SAU 55, where what the SAU did after this case came down with Green, the SAU said, okay, we will produce electronic records, but you have to come to the superintendent's office with a thumb drive in its original package, or you can buy one from us and we'll put it in our computer, electronically copy the records onto the thumb drive and give it to you. 
and and then a case entitled Taylor versus uh, the SAU 55 that was deemed to be compliant with the right to know law. My advice is this: if you have an electronic record and someone sends a request, and it could be an email request, I want a copy of this spreadsheet, or I want a copy of this document, and it's just a matter of, you know, hitting reply and going to your server and say, copy, paste, attach to a file, and sending it, and there really isn't any material harm that's going to be done to the municipality. I don't see the harm in doing that. It's a very simple way to comply with the right to know law and immediately make the records available. You could... As the Taylor case indicate, you could say, well, we're not going to email electronic records. We're going to tell people they've got to come to the superintendent's office, give us a thumb drive in the original package, we'll copy it onto the thumb drive. You could do that according to the Taylor case, although it's a Superior Court's case and we don't know what's going to happen in the Supreme Court. Again, my advice is if it's simple and easy and it's a matter of hit reply to the email request and attach a document. I think that makes the most sense, and I think that's the, the easiest way to comply and probably the most efficient. Yes? When you give them that copy, which I think you should, does it have to be one that they can manipulate once they have it, or does it have to? Interesting question. Okay, so, and I, I think that what that raises is, and I think the, 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 the trickier one is you've got your finance department has created a detailed spreadsheet that you use during your budgetary process. So the spreadsheet has a number of factors built into all the cells, and if you change this cell, it changes all the other cells. And, and what's underlying that, that the data that pops up on the cells, is a series of, of uh, algorithms or equations that are built into the spreadsheet. Um, so what, that, what you're really getting to is, is the town obligated to provide metadata? Because the data that you see is on the page, is the digital figures that are showing up on the page, but beneath that is the metadata that supports those, those that pieces of information. The jury's out on how much metadata you have to supply. Um, one could theoretically comply by this way. This, this is what I think is compliant. If someone asks you for a spreadsheet and you're concerned that the spreadsheet is going to be misused by someone in the world who would manipulate the data and, and then somehow present it at a, at a forum and show that someone is skullduggery in the finance department of a particular town. Let's assume that could occur. I think it would be reasonable if you have that concern and someone says, I want this spreadsheet. You could then print a PDF copy of the spreadsheet. So you can go into Excel and say, print a PDF copy. The PDF copy is just going to be a copy of the data that appears on the face of the spreadsheet. It's not going to provide the underlying uh, algorithms and the, and the equations. I think that's compliant. And you would not have to produce the metadata. You could just produce um, the, the, the raw data that appears on, on the face of the document. I so, think that's compliant. So if you give a paper copy, you don't have to give electronic? No, a PDF is an electronic document. <coughs> that's not a paper copy. So if you would, if, if you go into, if you print a, a, an Excel spreadsheet using PDF, it creates an electronic version of the same document, but without the metadata included. Okay. okay so all see. you're doing, it's in effect a copy. It's an electronic copy. That's what PDF is. It's an electronic copy. It's not a paper copy, but it has the same effect. So I think you could, if someone says, "Send me that spreadsheet," you would say, "Fine." You go up to File, Print but hopefully you have Adobe built into your system and you would print it as an Adobe document. That, I think, would be a compliant electronic response to send it as a, a, an Adobe PDF. I think that would be reasonable. And then you would not be disclosing the underlying um, metadata. Now, some people disagree. Some people say, well, if I've asked for a spreadsheet, I'm not just asking for what appears on the, on the face of the spreadsheet, which is the words or the numbers, I want the underlying metadata. I don't know that that's clear, but maybe, I mean, certainly at some point someone's going to say, I want this spreadsheet and I want the metadata too. And then you might have to struggle with, am I obligated to give that metadata? Is that part of what the governmental record has produced? It might be, and you might have to produce it. But if you just got a request for a spreadsheet, I would print a PDF of the spreadsheet and not send the metadata along with it. That's what, how I would approach it. But 
it's going to be more difficult if the person in the request says, I want the spreadsheet and the metadata. Then you're going to have to struggle with, is the person entitled to that? Now, theoretically, the metadata is also a governmental record. It's not something you see on the face of the spreadsheet, but it is, is it part of the governmental record? Probably is. Someone's going to argue that point at some point. It hasn't come up yet. That's basically all I can say. Yes? If a citizen is asking for a spreadsheet to inspect, then he has a right to come in and inspect that spreadsheet, correct? Yes. He, okay. can, he can come to town hall and say, can you produce that spreadsheet? Now, I don't know if, and not every town hall has this, but assume your town hall has a monitor that the citizen can access and look at. It's up the counter. And, and then that allow, and then the the town hall can put the document on a spreadsheet. I mean, on a thumb drive, and say, yes, here it is. It's on that thumb drive. They could show you it that way too. Right, but we're actually talking about a request to inspect a document in its original form, just like the minutes you, example you used a few a few moments ago. Right. So. So the spreadsheet itself is the original form. A true. PDF is a is a, 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 a derivation of that not the actual original form. It's a copy of it. So it's, but it's a derivation, not a copy. Well, and again... Because it's a PDF, not, an ex, not a spreadsheet. Right, and again, I, I would concede th what, whether <laughs> just Thank producing a, PV, a PDF is totally compliant. I think it could be, depending on how the request was, was presented. Right, precision in requesting is important. And, and one follow-up to that, uh, this refers to uh, uh, individuals making a request under 91A. Correct. It does not refer to, for example, requests officially made by, say, a budget committee for financial rec records. Correct? That doesn't apply here. Well, okay, so um, the budget committee is not a citizen. Right. A member of the budget committee could step outside of their role as a member of the budget committee and make a separate independent, uh, make a request as a citizen. No, the example I'm putting forth is the majority of the budget committee formally requests the spreadsheet. Well, the, again, t again, technically the Budget Committee is not a citizen having a right under the right to know law. Correct, but it does have rights under R RSA 32. Well, RSA 32 is a different set of rules, yes. Correct, so that would be what we're talking about right now does not apply to a body such as the Budget Committee making majority requests for documents. Uh, unless, that would be uh, operational under the RSA 32 law, is that correct? RSA 32 is the statute, and I can't remember the exact section right now off the top of my head. I which, believe it's 16. Uh, which talks about the duty of the governing body and the city and the town departments to make information available to the to the budget committee as requested to fulfill the budget committee's job. That's correct. Right. I just wanted clarification that what we were just speaking about only applies to 91A. Does not apply to RSA 32. Well, I don't think not, I don't think 91A is read into RSA Chapter 32. It That's is not correct. Right. It's so not this is into, just a discussion. 91A, not RSA 32. That's correct. Thank you. Um, so um, when you produce public records, you may have to redact those public records. And if you're going to have to redact because there's a part of the record which is subject to disclosure, but part of it that isn't. So I had to do this once for a town where um, it was a request to produce the memos that had been sent by the town manager <coughs> to the town council as part of the packet that was part of a public meeting. There were four paragraphs in the memo. Two of those paragraphs dealt with confidential information that had to do with welfare applicants. The other two paragraphs were public information. So what I had to do was redact out the confidential information about the welfare applicants and, uh, welfare applicants and provide the part of the record which was, which was public. And the redaction process, I would say, the way you'd achieve that is, if you're going to use a black magic marker, you would take a copy of the document do the magic marker part, obviously keep the original, uh, and then make a copy of that document. Don't send the one that you've used the magic marker on because you could hold it up to the light and see what's underneath it. You can also use PDF or Adobe to redact, but if you do use Adobe or electronic means to redact, you use the electronic document, you, you have the Adobe redact out the stuff you want to redact. Don't send the electronic copy because there's smart enough people out there who can unredact documents electronically. You would redact the document, make a copy of the redacted document, and then send that copy to the person who's the requester. Um, towns are allowed to charge reasonable fees, and so the, the case that is most on point is uh, Kelly versus the town of 
Hudson Assessing Department, where the court established that a reasonable fee of 50 cents per page was, in fact, consistent with the right to know law as established by the assessing office in the town of Hooksett. Ideally, what you should do is establish what is your internal overhead cost for producing public records. So you have to include not staff time, but paper, toner, equipment, uh, electricity, all the other components to produce a record and determine what is the actual cost to the town for producing a public record. When you produce public records, it's going to be a per page charge. There are some agencies out there that have a flat fee charge. When I was doing a lot of um, personal injury work, part of my job when I was doing municipal law, I also did personal injury work. I would also uh, often ask fire departments, police departments for a copy of a run sheet, and they would say, sure, it's a flat fee of $50. Uh, well, you can't have flat fees. That's inappropriate. It has to be a per page charge, and something close to 50 cents an hour is pretty much standard as an acceptable fee to charge for a public record. As Mark mentioned, we're going to talk a little bit about remedies uh, for violations. Important to know that there's no agency looking over your shoulder here. Um, so the only real enforcing agent in the state of New Hampshire my, the, sec, the Attorney General's office sometimes does right to know engagement or enforcement, but very rarely. Typically, it's only going to be by way of a lawsuit brought against the town in the Superior Court, where a Superior Court judge is going to visit the facts and circumstances and render a ruling. And that's typically why, if you end up having a ruling against you and that applicant for the record that you didn't disclose or to argument that you've held an improper non public session, that a person has hired an attorney, that person's attorney's law fee, attorney's fees are going to be charged against you if the town is found to be in violation, and they committed the violation with a knowing uh, violation uh, and acted it in bad faith or in, not in good faith under the statute as required to comply with the right to know law. And so the court, as it did in uh, the sandwich case, it assessed the town of a rather remarkable amount of $200,000. Uh, the attorney's fees bill that you would have to pay someone is probably the most painful bill any municipality has to pay. You sometimes don't want to even pay your own attorney, as I've experienced that myself, let alone having to pay someone else's attorney. Um, the court can also enjoin future violations. Yes? Is it true that uh, in, this, in this case, if one were to take a, a, a body to, a government body to court on the 91A, that uh, he would have to be an aggrieved party that filed the case? That is, they would have to demonstrate a harm that the court could remedy in order for him to standing in court? Well, yeah, the, the person who is before the court has to establish that they've um, suffered through a violation of the right to know law. But there's pretty broad standing. I mean, any citizen can argue that the conduct of a public body is violating the right to know law. And that person does not have to be a citizen of the town. So Jeffrey Clay has sued... Newmarket, uh, Dover, uh, a number of municipalities. I, I think uh, uh, Newington. Um, he, I think he, he Alton. Uh, so I don't even know where he lives, but he's he's all over the state um, enforcing the right to know law, um, and he doesn't have to show aggrievement in that he's aggrieved because um, it affects him as a citizen of the particular town. He just has to show there's a violation of the right to know law. He has the right to enforce it. I'm not, I don't think there's really going to be much in the way of what the person has to show that they've been personally harmed in order to have standing under the right to know law. I think all you have to demonstrate, I have found a violation of the right to know law. Your Honor, do the, do the right thing and enforce the law. That's really all you have to do. Um, as, as Mark said, the court can... Uh, order the the agents, the public agency, to do remedial training. Uh, the court can also issue an injunction telling the, the municipality, "Don't do that again." It's basic, like a cease and desist order. This is how you have to comply in the future to comply with the statute. Um, so that's the right to know law. I'm just going to turn now to a few other subjects, um, and I'm not going to try to keep you so long. What, what, Mark? We're running a little late, aren't we? Uh, about uh, 15 minutes, I 15 think, minutes. we started. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so um, there is a, a statute that you all should be aware of. It's a records retention statute. So the right to know law says all public records have to be available to the public. The records retention statute says there are certain public records that must be retained for certain periods of time. So, for instance, there are certain records which are permanent. Town meeting minutes are permanent records. Select board meetings 
are permanent uh, minutes, are permanent records. The statute has a long list, RSA 33-A, colon 3-A. is probably 100 separate um, entries there listing records you must maintain. So in the ideal world, the municipal record statute contemplates the town would have a municipal records committee made up of the select board, the town clerk, and other municipal officials who would go about the business of making sure the town is retaining the records as required for the required retention period. Um, there has been some additional flexibility afforded to towns in terms of document rent retention. It used to be that all rec records that have to be retained more than 10 years had to either be on microfilm or microfiche. Um, and if you say that to a millennial, they'll say, what? Uh, so um, now uh, you now have the ability to transfer them to a new format called PDFA, which is a, a, me a, a method of archiving through Adobe called PDFA Archive. So and you can save those records that are scheduled to be retained for less than 10 years in PDFA. Um, I've talked about recording of meetings uh, because I talked about the stuff that goes into the, the actual putting together the minutes and many times towns record minutes, uh, meetings by electronic means. It could be a digital recorder, it could be a cassette tape. You're not required to keep these recordings. You can keep the recordings. Some towns record, maybe in Hampton, all of your select board meetings on videotape. And you may archive them on your, uh, uh, your cable access channel. And they might be available for people to review. You're not required to do that. But if you do record your minutes and keep your, the, you, you record your meetings and you keep the recordings, whether digitally or on a uh, magnetic tape, they are public records and would have to be disclosed. If you have them, you have to disclose them. You're not required to keep them if you don't want to. Um, and finally, uh, I just want to point out some other resources. You can go to our website, uh, www.nhmunicipal.org, and under services, uh, there's a, a section called the Right to Know Law, and there's a lot of materials there, including, which I pointed out before, you can go to that section and get a copy of this document in a Word format. You can then uh, put in the various inserts and uh, other information about your particular municipality to use in your town. Um, the Attorney General's Office has a memorandum, which is a little bit more um, lawyer-like, but you can also refer to that. It's at the, available at the doj.nh.gov. Uh, there's the text of the statute that you can go to the general court and they have all the RSAs there. And we are producing a brand new book entitled uh, Guide to Open Government, which will be available uh, in June. And if you are interested, we're going to have a workshop on that on June 8th. So um, with that, it completes my presentation on the right to know law. And I just have a few things I want to talk to you about ethics. So before I go to about ethics, do I have any general questions about the right to know law? Yes. I was a little confused about the statement you made regarding the creation of minutes. Uh huh. When when the minutes become official? I think you said earlier that uh, as long as it's published by the minute taker within three days, everything's good, right? But meeting minutes require a, me meeting a, minutes are not required to be approved by the public body. Okay. They just have to be produced within five business days. So my my follow up question is: Who is actually legally speaking responsible? for producing the minutes? The public body. The public body. So in order for the public body to produce minutes, doesn't the public body have to, by majority vote, approve the minutes that were created? The right to know law does not require approval of public meeting minutes. The right, right to know law does not. The right to right. know law does not require you have to have an approval. All that's required is you produce minutes. And that's not to say that other laws do. Right. There's no law I'm aware of in New Hampshire that requires that meeting minutes of a public body in New Hampshire be approved by the public body. Well, that's the point of confusion. If a public body is, as a whole is responsible for the creation of public minutes, and the public body as a whole does not actually act in the creation of those minutes, then isn't the public body not creating those minutes? Uh, no. The public body meets. The public body has someone in the meeting room, preferably... A, mem a member of staff or a member of the public body who takes the minutes, mm -hmm. those minutes are produced in five business days. Mm -hmm. um, but they don't have to be approved by the public body. They have to be produced in five business days. Now, as I said before, a public body could decide 
within five business days of every meeting to reconvene and approve their minutes. They could do that. They're not required to. They just have to produce them in five business days. And it doesn't matter whether the, the public body has subsequently <laughs> met and uh, decided to approve their content. That's what's confusing to me. If the public body does not take explicit action in the creation of the minutes, how can it be said that the public body created the minutes? Well, um, all I can tell you is the statute requires the public body to produce them within five business days, mm -hmm. and they do not have to be approved. Uh, that's all I can tell you. Mm -hmm. uh, you're s supposing that somehow that would create a set of minutes which are not approved by the public body. I'm telling you this is what the statute requires. It's confusing. Sorry about that. I didn't write the law. It's not the only one that's um, confusing. Right? <laughs> so what I'm going to talk about a little bit about ethics, um, which uh, is bears um, on the business of being a member of a public official or being a member of a public body, a elected or appointed official. Um, so when we talk about ethics and we talk about conflicts of interest and incompatibility, there's a lot of things that come to mind. And those which um, are of interest to those who are in the field of public service um, are ones which uh, come to uh, kind of reflect not only how our society operates as a republic and a democracy, but how a local government operates. Um, so when you talk about conflict of interest and ethics and incompatibility, it's basic concepts of how you legislate civility in the social compact we have as local government. Um, so the police protect us from harm, uh, and they do that in order to refrain us from doing harm to ourselves. Government provides services only if we pay for taxes. People disagree where the line is drawn, but the general idea is living in a society, we all have rules that we have to agree to. Um, so, generally, ethics are defined by Merriam-Webster as rules of behavior based on ideas about which is normally good and bad. When we talk about how this applies to the business of being an elected or appointed official, we're talking about such things as making sure we avoid conflicts of interest, making sure we disclose financial interests that may be uh, of merit, of concern as, as a public official, how you're making a decision, avoiding obviously criminal behavior and following state and local law, respecting confidentiality, not abusing authority, and probably more important than anything else, treating people fairly and equally who come before your public body as a public official. Honesty, integrity, and trustworthiness, avoiding the appearance of impropriety. Those are all concepts that come into the idea of ethics. So um, when we talk about ethics, I also have here the concept of incompatibility which is a totally different concept. There are certain circumstances where you as a public official, if you hold two certain positions, they're going to be incompatible. So someone cannot be both the master of a certain area of the law and also be a master of an area of the law which is closely related there too and be able to make a decision based upon our own decision making. So to give you an example, Let's assume you had a municipal land use attorney who could elect to the planning board. Although the attorney planning board member would be disqualified for making decisions on an application brought by a developer, it doesn't mean he's disqualified for being a member of the board. So just because I represent developers doesn't mean I can't be on the planning board. But certainly when I'm on the planning board and my developer client comes before the board, I have to disqualify myself. So that would be an example of a conflict. An incompatibility would be I cannot be both the treasurer of the town and a member of the select board. It's by statute and also by common sense, because the treasurer is those who have to keep the dollars that have been collected through the taxpayers. The, tre the select board is invested with the authority to decide how to spend public funds. But you don't have the person who holds the public money have the power to spend those funds. That's an incompatibility, which is by statute under 669 colon 7 is prohibited. So there are a number of per se incompatible positions in municipal government. Um, and those mean if you are incompatible, you cannot hold those positions. You can all, also cannot run for both positions at the same time. So as an example, um, no person can hold two of the following officers, treasurer, moderator, trustee of trust funds, select board, or head of the town's police department. No person can at the same time hold the office of town treasurer and town clerk. A select board cannot be a full-time employee. No official handling funds can at the same time hold the officer of, office of auditor. And no select board, 
member, moderator, town clerk, or inspector of elections that can at the same time serve as a supervisor of the checklist. Of course, it would make perfect sense to avoid having uh, a town clerk work on the supervisor of the checklist because they're incompatible positions. The town clerk is in charge of keeping the record of the actual balloting. Supervisor of the checklist is trying to ensure that you have a clean election. You have an election of persons who are registered to vote, and when they vote, they're actually checked off in a, in a fashion to ensure we don't have double counting or double voting by people in the electorate. Um, so those are statutory incompatibilities which are designed to ensure someone who spends money also isn't the person who's holding the money, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so when, as opposed to an incompatibility, when would you have a conflict of interest? So a conflict of interest would be when a person has a particular interest in the outcome such they should be disqualified because their interest is different from the interest and conflicting with the interest of the public. And that's fairly easy to understand. If you have a financial interest in the outcome, the planning board member who is representing developers, whose developer client is appearing for the planning board, I know that that planning board member might suffer a loss of business if he doesn't vote in favor of his developer client. That's easy to understand. Another one easy to understand, if you're in a butter to a land use project and you're a member of the Zoning Board of Adjustment, clearly you have to avoid voting on that particular uh, variance application because you're in a butter to the subject property. You have an interest in the outcome. Your interest, your personal interest, will cloud your ability to do the public interest because you're going to be more concerned about your personal outcome rather than the interest of weighing the merits of the particular variance application that may be coming before the board or body at that particular time. So those are easy things to understand when you have a conflict. It can get harder, and I'll give you an example. Uh, assume for a moment, this was a question that came up to me the other day. You're a, a, um, uh, an active real estate um, practice in a particular town, and you're appointed to the planning board. Um, and so let's assume for a moment that your planning board has before it a project which was a project involving property that you had sold. The property has been sold. Now the buyer has bef come before the planning board, and you're about to act on a project that involves land that you had just recently sold from property owner A to B. Now one could argue, well, your interest in the outcome is no longer there because the transaction took place six months ago, and now the new owner is there, you sold it, you it helped the transaction from party A to part party B, and now the new owner is before the planning board to get planning board approval. Do I have a conflict of interest? Well, as I looked at the issue, helping this woman uh, sort through the issue, I said, well, Here's the problem that I foresee. Um, if it is known that you were involved in the original transaction, it may be that people would perceive you as someone who is um, helping the community develop in a fashion that is contrary to their interests. And it may be that other people who want to sell property that are going to get subdivided would be more inclined to come to you because they know, oh, oh she's on the planning board, She's gotten one property uh, sold. That's before the planning board for a project. Maybe others would uh, similarly act to come to her because she has that specific uh, attribute of being on the planning board, and that would attract more customers to her. One could argue that at some point that would become a conflict of interest. Um, and maybe she has to avoid acting on applications where she had a hand at some point in the transaction involving <coughs> the sale or purchase of particular property. So. You really have to balance what is the personal interest against the public interest. And if the personal interest is significantly outweighed by the public, the public interest or in any fashion invades the ability of person to make a fair decision, then there's likely a conflict of interest. Um, one of the ways we look at conflicts of interest and also weighing whether the merits of a member of a public body has to recuse themselves is to break down the difference between legislative and quasi-judicial decision making. And a legislative decision making is something where, say, a select board is acting on a decision whether or not to put forward a proposed budget article or proposed budget item. That's a legislative decision. So you could have that as a policy decision the person who's making the decision has to act in the public's interest, but they don't have to be completely indifferent. Because in fact, when the budget committee 
what the select board is putting together the budget, they're also taxpayers. And, and they also recognize that how they manufacture or put together a budget has an impact on their paying their taxes. So they're not required to be completely indifferent. Uh, and even if they are participating, their decision would not invalidate the vote. And because the courts recognize you can have someone participate, maybe they should have recused themselves, but it's a legislative decision. It's not quasi-judicial. So even if they voted, that's not going to be something which is going to require that the decision be invalidated because as long as there was enough votes in favor, even the participating member who arguably should have recused himself is not going to require invalidation. But then we have these things called quasi-judicial. These are situations where a board is acting to adjudicate the rights of two different parties. The easiest one to understand is the planning board. The planning board is acting to approve or disapprove a subdivision plan. You've got the applicant's interest. You've got the abutter's interest. And they're competing. And the board has got to weigh the interests of both sides, make a judgment based on facts and circumstances it has before us, and ultimately make a decision whether we'll approve the plan, approve the plan with conditions, or deny the plan. And that's going to be weighing the interests of both the applicant and the abutter. When a board acts in that situation, it's called quasi-judicial. And when it does that, there's a higher standard. And the higher standard is if there is a member who participates in that decision that has any particular a uh, conflict of interest and is not indifferent or is their interest is different than the public at large and they participate in the decision that's going to invalidate the action by the board and the best example of that is the case of Winslow versus the town of Holderness and in the Winslow versus town of Holderness case the select the the planning board had a project that was about to come before it it was well known in town and I don't remember the particulars but let's assume it was a large subdivision plan there was a gentleman in town who was a vociferous opponent of the project. It was well known he was an opponent of the project. Uh, and for whatever reason, he gets appointed to the planning board just as the time the project came to fruition as a final application and was being acted upon by the planning board. This is a gentleman who, it was fair to say he had prejudged the, the merits of the application. When the application came before the planning board, of course he voted against it. Now, the application actually uh, was not voted, it was, it, the, the vote was such that even if he had participated, if it was a legislative decision, his vote would not have been the outcome. But the mere fact that he participated in the decision is all, at all rendered the judgment invalid. That is, the court said his participation infected the entire process. The fact that he should have recused himself that he clearly had prejudged it, he wasn't indifferent, was of such material impact on the decision as a whole that you had to invalidate the action of the board because his participation made it an unfair uh, process for all concerned, and therefore because acting as a judge you have to be above reproach, that judgment was invalidated. Um, so those are the ways in which we evaluate, you know, in what way would a conflict of interest render a decision one where a member of the board could uh, cause the decision made by the board to be uh, declared void, uh, no longer uh, a, a valid decision of the board. What we do tell people when we're talking about avoiding conflicts of interest, whether it's a legislative interest or legislative action or a quasi-judicial action, what we do encourage you to understand is, um, what my point of view is, if, you're, if you are in doubt, you should sit out. If you have a concern, you have a conflict of interest, it's different from the interest of the public at large. Uh, the better approach is to recuse yourself and just avoid participating. And recusal means I'm not going to actually participate at all in the process. I actually recuse myself, make it known to the members of the board, and leave the, the body itself, leave the table. Uh, don't go into the audience. Typically, I think the better practice is to recuse and to leave the room and not to participate in the process at all from that point forward. Planning boards actually have an interesting process under 673, colon 14, actually all land use boards, where the land use board can actually, a member can say, I'm not sure I have a conflict of interest. Uh, let's go back to the member uh, that I talked about before of the planning board who was a real estate agent, and she brings to the planning board, okay, this application is before the board. It uh, just so happens that I sold this property from property owner A to, to the current applicant, property owner B, six months ago. I'm not sure I have a conflict of interest. 
interest, and they would discuss the facts and circumstances and then ask the board to give them an advisory vote. Do you think I should recuse myself? Am I conflicted? Should I avoid the appearance of impropriety or not? And that advisory vote can help the board member make the decision. Ultimately, however, it's up to the whole, the, the individual themselves to decide whether they want to recuse yourself. Um, but if you're in doubt, if there's any possibility, especially if you're acting in a quasi-judicial capacity, it's better to, you know, uh, sit it out uh, when, when you have a doubt. Um, and that's the reason why most boards, other than the select board, have alternates. And most land use boards can have up to five alternates. So you have these alternates that could sit in place of a member who has a conflict of interest. Um, and then, if necessary, you could perhaps proceed with a full board. Without a full board, however, a ZBA is a particularly different situation because with a ZBA, assume for a moment you've got a member who's got a conflict of interest, let's say they're in a butter, um, and you don't have enough alternates there, so a, a ZBA has to have five members present, and if you now only have four members, a ZBA, when it takes action, has to have three votes in favor of an application. So it's more difficult to get three votes out of five, a let, a three votes out of four, than three votes out of five. Because you've got to you convince uh, fewer people out of the total number of those who are present. So a lot of ZBAs will say, if we don't have a full quorum, uh, that is of five members, we'll continue until we do. So that's something to consider uh, if, if you're dealing with this situation. But generally, other than the ZBAs, I think the better approach is if you're in doubt about whether or not you should recuse, then you probably should recuse yourself. Towns also have the power under 3139A to adopt local conflicts of interest ordinances. And these are ordinances that um, the town meeting would adopt, and they can apply to elected and appointed officials. Some towns adopt conflict of interest ordinances that require financial disclosures. I know in a town I represented in southern New Hampshire, they had a very detailed conflict of interest ordinance so that new public officials had to make a disclosure through financial interests forms with the, uh, what's called an ethics board. They were kept on file so that as time went by through the process the member was on that particular board, those forms could be checked to see if a particular vote may have been infected by some personal financial interest. Um, so you can have a statute like this. It has to be adopted by the town meeting. It cannot be adopted by the governing body. Um, it can also authorize a local ethics board, but the, any such statute that the town would adopt could not authorize a town to remove people from public office. Only the Superior Court can do that. However, there is one area where the select board can remove land use board members. So land use board members under 673.13 by the select board can be removed for an inefficiency, neglect of duty, or now malfeasance. Most other boards and bodies in the town, the select board doesn't have that authority. Um, and you could not adopt a local ordinance under conflicts of interest statute 3139A to require removal, you could set up a series of standards that could be used to, comp to seek a removal of a public official in uh, a, a, a proceeding before the Superior Court. Just a few things I want to say about effective meetings, and um, I mentioned before that I brought a copy of this um, article which was produced by Fred Riggins called uh, The Riggins Rules. Uh, and they're very handy and very insightful and I think pithy little observations about being a public official, how to be an effective member of a public body, how to uh, make sure the business of that public body is, is uh, held up to a high standard and that you uh, don't through conduct at a public meeting um, tarnish the reputation of the public body or of public government as a whole. One of the things I, I do want to read it's uh, uh, article number 28. Now, I read this because I actually found myself to be in this position. Was I, I was sitting on the Bow Planning Board for a number of years, and I was probably a loudmouth lawyer and probably annoyed a lot of my Planning Board members, uh, fellow members, quite a bit. Because I found myself thinking this very same paragraph, which is paragraph 28. And he says here, and this is the last section of his rules, do sit down and have a long, soul-searching session with yourself if you find you are consistently out in left field, that no one seems inclined to second your profound motions, and that you are quite often a minority of one. You might be theoretically right, and probably are, but give some thought to what is practical and just. 
don't be stiff-necked in your opinions, give a little bit. And I think that's really good advice, because I certainly found, after my first five years of being on the planning board, that I had to listen to my fellow board members and cooperate with them, and work cooperatively to come to decisions that were sensible for all concerned, rather than just, you know, that I'm right and everyone has to listen to me. Um, a couple other things I want to say about effective meetings. One of the things which is true, which happens with every public body, is that the, it typically is the case that the chair of the public body, whether it's the select board or the planning board or the ZBA, you tend to rotate it. Let's now, now it's my turn to be chair, or, or someone else should be chair, or the most senior person becomes chair. And I gotta say, um, that's not always the best choice. There are certain people who are really skilled at running public meetings, and certain people are not. So I would not advocate simply saying that the most senior person on your public body becomes your chair, because it's a difficult job, and it's a job that not everyone can fulfill. And I think you all know if you've been on a, on a meeting, whether a meeting's being well, well run, or it's plodding along, and, and you're dissipating that one very important resource, which you don't want to dissipate, the, act, the um, active attention and ability of volunteers to contribute to uh, public meetings. Because there's nothing worse than having volunteers who come to public meetings get frustrated with whether a board is getting its job done and they just leave in frustration. Sometimes they quit and they never come back. So I would encourage you to think when you're talking about at your public body who you're going to appoint as chair, don't just rotate it automatically to the most senior person. Think about who's the most effective able to get the business of the public meeting done. Other thing that's important about public meetings having rules of procedure. Every public body should have rules of procedure. In fact, land use boards are required to have rules of procedure. And they don't have to be more complicated than this is the order of business. We deal with minutes first, new items, uh, old business, uh, however you want to order, order your agenda. Having rules of procedure, it's having rules of the road so that members of the public, when they come in, you have a copy of your rules of procedure, they have a question of what's going on, they can look to the rules of procedure and say, oh, they're at this section of the agenda, and if you follow it consistently, then you're going to find that everyone is aware of how you run your meetings, and of ultimately, the, the business of getting the, the job of your particular public body is going to be uh, much more effective. Um, a lot of times we're asked questions about whether it's a good idea to adopt rules of procedure such as Robert's Rules of Procedure. And generally we would say, we have a copy of Robert's Rules of Procedure. It's about this thick. Occasionally I will refer to it for particular issues that are important to know legally, but I would never want to uh, urge a, a, a local municipal body in New Hampshire to adopt Robert's Rules of Procedure because they're much too dense and turgid to go through to use for everyday business of running a local official, uh, a, a public body such as a planning board or a select board. I think, again, there are lots of, uh, you can Google, uh, you know, procedural rules uh, in New Hampshire for public bodies and come up with another examples. I would just offer one that I, I thought was pretty good. The town of Hooks at Town Council has a really good set of public uh, meeting procedure rules, which would be an excellent re reference tool. I know that in the town of Hudson, they have a really good set of bylaws that are described how the Zoning Board of Adjustment operates. They're, they're available all over the place. I would recommend those as two sources to turn to as ones that could be a model for your public body to have a set of rules and procedure to operate on. Um, with that, I would say that thank you for your attending. Uh, it's been a rather uh, long evening. It's almost 9.20. Um, so uh, we're a little bit over our original time frame for about two hours, but I'd be happy to uh, continue the session in uh, the uh, process where we would meet in non-public session to further discuss, uh, have a non-meeting, uh, excuse me, uh, to uh, discuss any particular questions members might have, and that would be for elected and appointed officials. Yeah, so we're going to do that if anybody wants to stay to that. If anybody does not want to stay, they welcome to leave. <laughs> Uh, it's up to you. Uh, do that. So if I can have a motion to adjourn the meeting. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? All right, so the meeting is adjourned. Anybody who's an appointed official or an elected official is welcome to stay.